Today is one of those days where I did too much and then uh, I'm really tired now so I, I have no inhibitions. Today I went to Austin, Texas to check out the college there and I went to two bookstores. The first one was a like a new bookstore well, a bookstore for new books. And it was okay. I got uh, a facsimile edition of the 1922 Ulysses by James Joyce. So that, I like that because I've been trying to decide on which well, I've been interested in the modernist, like, novelists lately. Musil, Proust, and Joyce. So I got one. And then also, I went to a half-price books there. And at that other bookstore, I saw a selected poems of Frank O'Hara. But at the half-price books, they had a collected poems for only for only thirteen dollars so I bought it because I I watched his video having a coke with you and it's just so perfect it's just uh, like one of the one of the best poems I've read in a while but another one I like that I don't think is on YouTube at least there isn't a recording of him reading it a step away from them. So I'm going to read it now. It's my lunch hour, so I go for a walk among the hum colored cabs. First, down the sidewalk, where laborers feed their dirty, glistening torsos, sandwiches, and Coca Cola with yellow helmets on. They protect them from falling bricks, I guess. Then onto the avenue where skirts are flipping above heels and blow up over grates. The sun is hot, but the cab stirs up the air. I look at bargains in rich wristwatches. There are cats playing in sawdust. On to Times Square, where the sign blows smoke over my head, and higher the waterfall pours lightly. A negro stands in a doorway with a toothpick, languorously agitating. A blonde chorus girl clicks, he smiles and rubs his chin. Everything suddenly honks. It is 12.40 of a Thursday. Neon in daylight is a great pleasure, as Edwin Denby would write, as are light bulbs in daylight. I stop for a cheeseburger at Juliet's Corner, Julieta Massina, wife of Federico Fellini, a bella trice and chocolate malted. A lady in foxes on such a day puts her poodle in a cab. There are several Puerto Ricans on the avenue today, which makes it beautiful and warm. First Bunny died, then John Latouche, then Jack Jackson Pollock. <clears throat> but is the earth as full as life was full of them? And one has eaten and one walks past the magazines with nudes and the posters for bullfight and the Manhattan storage warehouse, which they'll soon tear down. I used to think they had the armory show there. A glass of papaya juice and back to work. My heart is in my pocket. It is poems by Pierre Reverdy. One of my guilty pleasures, I would say, is watching the daily vlogs that people make, like uh, Casey Neistat is a good one, and Frank O'Hara's poems remind me of that, but they're much more, uh, I guess you could say cultured, but Because the reason I, l I love that is 
no one I know reads or like knows anything about classical music or like blues music or jazz. So it's just such a treat. And then I'm going to read Having a Coke with you. Even though there's a recording on YouTube of him reading it and it's way better. So watch that instead. Having a Coke with you is even more fun than going to San Sebastian, Irun, Andai, Beiritz, Bayonne, or being sick to your stomach on the Travesera de Grazia in Barcelona. Partly because in your orange shirt you look like a better, happier Saint Sebastian, partly because of my love for you, partly because of your love for yogurt, partly because of the fluorescent orange tulips around the birches, partly because of the secrecy our smiles take on before people and statuary. It is hard to believe when I'm with you that there can be anything as still, as solemn, as unpleasantly definitive as statuary when right in front of it. In the warm New York four o'clock light, we are drifting back and forth between each other like a tree breathing through its spectacles. And the portrait show seems to have no faces in it at all, just paint. You suddenly wonder why in the world anyone ever did them. I look at you, and I would rather look at you than all the portraits in the world, except possibly for the Polish writer, occasionally. And anyway, it's in the Frick, which, thank heavens, you haven't gone to yet so we can go together the first time. And the fact that you move so beautifully more or less takes care of futurism, just as, at home, I never think of the new descending a staircase, or at a rehearsal a single drawing of Leonardo or Michelangelo that used to wow me. And what good does all the research of the Impressionists do them, when they never got the right person to stand near the tree when the sun sank? Or for that matter, Marino Marini, when he didn't pick the rider as carefully as the horse? It seems they were all cheated of some marvelous experience, which is not going to go wasted on me, which is why I'm telling you about it. Such a good poem, oh my goodness. Well, I have really nothing to say about it. <laughs> I think it says, I think it explains itself perfectly, so. And then another thing I'll do because I really don't have the mental faculties right now to create a thought, but I'm going to read sections from uh, Robert Musil's A Man Without Qualities. I'm just going to read two sections. If I get it right, which may not happen. But, okay, so this one is called A Chapter That May Be Skipped by Anyone Not Particularly Impressed by Thinking as an Occupation. Ulrich, meanwhile, was at home, sitting at his desk, working. He had got out the research paper he had interrupted in the middle weeks ago, when he had decided to return from abroad. He did not intend to finish it, but it diverted him to see that he could still do that sort of thing. The weather was fine, but in the last few days he had gone out only on brief errands. He had not even set foot in the garden. He had drawn the curtains and was working in the subdued light like an acrobat in a dimly lit circus arena, rehearsing dangerous new somersaults. For a panel of experts before the public has been let in. The precision, vigor, and sureness of his mode of thinking, which has no equal anywhere in life, filled him with something like melancholy. He now pushed back the sheets of paper covered with symbols and formulas, the last thing he had written down being an equation for the state of water as a physical example to illustrate the application of a new mathematical process, 
but his thoughts must have strayed a while before. Wasn't I telling Clarice something about water? He mused, but could not recall the particulars. But it didn't really matter, and his thoughts roamed idly. Unfortunately, nothing is so hard to achieve as a literary representation of a man thinking. When someone asked a great scientist how he managed to come up with so much that was new, he replied, because I never stopped thinking about it. And it is surely safe to say that unexpected insights turn up for no other reason than that they are expected. They are in no small part a success of character, emotional stability, unflagging ambition, and unremitting work. What a bore such constancy must be. Looking at it another way, the solution of an intellectual problem comes about not very differently from a dog with a stick in his mouth trying to get through a narrow door. He will turn his head left and right until the stick slips through. We do much the same thing, but with the difference that we don't make indiscriminate attempts, but already know from experience approximately how it's done. And if a clever fellow naturally has far more skill and experience with these twistings and turnings than a dim one, the slipping through takes the clever fellow just as much by surprise. It is suddenly there, and one perceptibly feels slightly disconcerted because one's ideas seem to have come of their own accord instead of waiting for their creator. This disconcerted feeling is nowadays called intuition by people who would have formally believing that it must be regarded as something suprapersonal, have called it inspiration. But it is only something impersonal, namely the affinity and coherence of the things themselves, meeting inside a head. The better the head, the less evident its presence in this process. As long as the process of thinking is in motion, it is quite wretched. Is it, it is a quite wretched state as if all the brain's convolutions were suffering from colic. And when it is finished, it no longer has the form of thinking process as one experiences it already, that of what has been thought, which is regrettably impersonal. For the thought then faces outward and is dressed for communication to the world. When a man is in the process of thinking, there is no way to catch the moment between the, imper the personal and the impersonal, and this is manifestly why thinking is such an embarrassment for writers that they gladly avoid it. But the man without qualities was now thinking. One may draw the conclusion from this that, at least in part, not a personal affair. But then what is it? World in and world out. Aspects of world falling into place inside a head. Nothing of any importance had occurred to him. After he had thought about water as an example, nothing had occurred to him except that water is something three times the size of the land, even counting only what everyone recognizes as water. Rivers, seas, lakes, springs. It was long thought to be akin to air. The great Newton thought so, and yet most of his other, mother, most of his other ideas are still as up-to-date as if they had been thought today. The Greeks thought that the world and life had arisen from water. It was a god, Okeanos. Later, water sprites, elves, mermaids, and nymphs were invented. Temples and oracles were, were built by the water's edge. The cathedrals of Hildesheim, Paderborn, and Bremen were all built over springs. And behold, are these cathedrals not still standing today? And isn't water still used for baptism? And aren't there devotees of water and apostles of natural healing whose souls are in such oddly sepulchral health? So there is a place in the world like a blurred spot or grass trodden flat. And of course, the man without qualities also had modern scientific concepts in his head, whether he happened to be thinking of them or not. According to them, water is a colorless liquid, blue only in thick layers, odorless and tasteless, as you recited over and over in school until you never forget it. Although, physiologically, 
It also contains bacteria, vegetable matter, iron, air, calcium sulfate, and calcium bicarbonate. And although physically this archetype of liquids is not basically a liquid at all, but depending on circumstances, a solid, a liquid, or a gas, ultimately it all dissolves into a system of formulas, all somehow interlinked. And they were only a few dozen people in the whole world who thought alike about even so simple a thing as water. All the rest talk about it in languages that belong somewhere between today and some thousands of years ago. So one must say that as soon as a man begins to reflect even a little, he falls into disorderly company. Now Ulrich remembered that he had in fact told all of this to Clarisse, who was no better educated than a little animal, but notwithstanding the superstition she was made of, one had a vague feeling of oneness with her. The thought pricked him like a hot needle. He was annoyed with himself. The well-known ability of thought as recognized by doctors to dissolve and dispel those deep raging, morbidly tangled and matted conflicts generated in the dank regions of the self apparently rests on nothing other than its social and worldly nature, which links the individual creature to other people and objects. But unfortunately, the healing power of thought seems to be the same faculty that diminishes the personal sense of experience. A casual reference to a hair on a nose weighs more than the most important concept, and acts, feelings, and sensations when reported in words, can make one feel one has been present at a more or less notable personal event, however ordinary and impersonal the facts, feelings, and sensations may be. It's idiotic, Ulrich thought, but that's how it is. I said I was going to read two, but I could really make it through that. I'm tired. I left this morning at 8, drove three hours to Austin, visited the university, went to a bookshop, ate some lunch, visited a record store, got a John Fahey record, went to the Half Price Books, visited the university again. And then drove home at like 5.30, got home at 8.30. 12 hour day. And right now it's like probably 10 o'clock. I have work tomorrow on homework. Damn. When I was driving home, I thought of the Eugene O'Neill title, A Long Day's Journey Into Night. <laughs> But it's nothing like, nothing bad. Well, I had a great day. I went to Austin alone and it was good. Yeah, this video, if I wasn't tired, I wouldn't make it. <laughs> I hope that doesn't make it worthless.